is a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Richard Pasco, DDS MS of New Edge Technologies. Richard graduated from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry in 1970. He completed a 12-month rotating dental internship at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Leavenworth, Kansas. I know that city well. I grew up in Wichita. I went to Leavenworth a lot. After one year as a staff dentist, he began a 24-month residency program in periodontics at the VA Hospital in Leavenworth in conjunction with the University of Missouri-Kansas City of Dentistry. That's where I graduated in 87. I love that city. God, that's a great city. He completed his formal training in 74, received a certificate in perio from Leavenworth VA Hospital and a Master's of Science degree from the University of Missouri. Dr. Pasco was a staff periodontist and director of periodontal residency program at the VA Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee from 74 to 76. Did you ever get to see B.B. King play when you were down there? No, I didn't. Oh, no. my gosh. You should get a <laughs> refund from the school. That should be... Uh, and you know what? I don't care what they say about nutrition. That guy, I only ate barbecue, and he lived to be what ninety four. So, uh, so I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna go on the BB King barbecue diet. Doctor Pasco started his private practice limited to Perio in 1976 in Traverse City, Michigan. Shortly thereafter, he established a pra- practice in Cadillac, Michigan. He has been retired from practice since 2012. Doctor Pasco is a member of the American Academy of Periodontology, the Academy of Osseo Integration the Michigan Dental Association, the Midwest Society of Periodontology, and the Michigan Periodontal <laughs> Association. He is the past president of the Resort District Dental Society. Dr. Pasco developed a patented hand sharpening stone for scalers and curettes. He has a company, NewEdgeTechnologies.com, that produces the sharpener and a retail arm, TrueEdgeDental.com, that sells the product. He also has a blog, TrueEdgeDentalBlog.com, with an emphasis on non-surgical periodontal therapy, and I wanted, I wanted to get you on the show um, because there's nine professions, uh, specialties that are recognized by the ADA. And I think periodontics has changed the most in the last three decades of any other specialty. Do you agree or disagree with that? No, I would very much agree. Starting with all the regeneration procedures and then of course, uh, the, the biggest change in dentistry since I've been practicing has been implants. And, of course, that's an integral part of the periodontal practice now. So I, I agree. Perio, periodontics is, uh, there's been a, a big shift in, the, in the, the method of practice and the, the knowledge in that specialty. Well, I want to, I I um, this show is really about kids, Rick, because podcasting is not some. I'm a grandpa. I got a four-year-old granddaughter. Podcasting is not a grandpa behavior. You don't see grandmas sitting there. Uh, listening to podcasts, so most the data shows are pretty much all 30 and under and I can confirm that I get a gazillion emails a day and they're always kids they're they're either seniors in dental school or they've been out last five years so you can give them so much how, how many years did you do perio oh over 40 years so you got 40 years of wisdom that you can impart to these young kids and and so so just just start off um, I, I want to the historical perspective is periodontal disease, I mean, have we been successful at a, as a profession? Is it going down as far as the number of uh, percentage of people with it? Is it flat? Is it going up? Are our treatments for periodontal disease, are they better now than they were 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago? T- tell us the history of perio as you've seen it for four decades. Well, um, that's, a, that's a broad question. Uh, periodontics is, has grown in, in its knowledge tremendously over the years. Uh, I think the basics of periodontics have not changed, but the options available to us for treatment certainly have. Um, the, the old scaling and root planing is still the backbone of periodontal therapy. And of course, uh, surgery uh, has evolved into the regeneration procedures, the augmentation procedures, and that's morphed into the, uh, uh, the realm of implants, which um, uh, are an integral part of treatment planning in periodontal therapy. So, you know, I, I always notice um, inconsistencies about how a dentist will treat himself or his spouse or his children versus the consumer. For instance, you'll almost never find a dentist that will do veneers on his 20-year-old daughter because she's got a big prom date or wedding coming up. He'll always make her do orthodontics and bleaching. And I also notice that um, dentists, and in my practice, I, I got a hygienist that, that just doesn't want to pull 
three uh, three rooted teeth involvement and go straight to implant. So, so what I'm saying is, it seems like a lot of dentists with perio just say, yeah, this will be better with an implant. But when it's themselves, you see them doing a lot more perio, a lot more advanced stuff. I mean, it's kind of an emotional deal. Like, I wouldn't want to have a tooth pulled out if there's any way you could save it. But I think a lot of dentists are going quick to implants. And, the re and so my question is, a lot of these young kids are getting mixed uh, signals from their community of periodontists, oral surgeons, general dentists. You got a perio tooth. What, what are you thinking when you say try to save the tooth, scaling and replaning, or pulling it and do implant titanium? Well, the implant is, is just another uh, tool in our armamentarium. I, I think there has been a shift in that we may have uh, had a, a strategic abutment that we would we would go to extremes to retain to avoid a removal of prosthesis. I think um, uh, there's there's a a shift to removing this the two sooner in treatment uh, to have a more predictable outcome. Um, I actually experienced this just recently. I had a, a number 23. I had an uh, asymptomatic endodontic situation about 15 years ago and I had endo. And um, um, I started to get some periapical tenderness about six months ago. So I went to my friendly uh, endodontist and uh, he did an apical, which um, didn't, do, didn't solve the problem. And long story short, it was a cracked tooth. And so the tooth was removed and an implant's been placed. And now I'm waiting for integration to have the crown done. But I, it, it's just another tool. And I, I think it's a good tool. Um, and I think I, I can look back into my practice and I can see a number of cases where I um, went to extremes to save a tooth that I could better off have replaced with an implant. Can you can you kind of help her out a little bit? I mean, she's uh, she's looking at a patient. It's got perio. Obviously, you can do a lot more to save one rooted teeth than you can a three rooted molar. But um, specifically, let's go to three year uh, three rooted molars. And and the tooth most likely to be missing is the first molar. Let's go to three rooted maxillary first molars. Um, okay. Can you kind of help her about when you know it's got a six or a seven? Talk, talk about the, the kind of the line when we say, yeah, we can fix that or nah, let's just, let's just remove that and go titanium. Well, um, I, first thing you got to do is look at what's on the end of that tooth, uh, the patient. And you have to determine their, um, uh, their interest in retaining the tooth, their dental IQ, um, the, um, um, uh, the health of the patient. Um, there's so many factors involved. Pocket depth is just a minor factor in determining the salvageability of a tooth. You want to e evaluate the furcation exposure. Um, you want to um, assess the mobility. Uh, you want to assess the patient's desires. And um, boy, there's so many factors that enter into a treatment plan it's it's hard to put it into an outline or a, a quick book a cookbook approach to it um it's just taking that patient and evaluating him and um, um determining what their desires are um none the least being the rest of the dentition you know what is the second molar like what's the second bicuspid like um, um the old days we did a lot of root amputations and the success rate was not very good because they were very, very hard to keep clean. Um, and uh, uh, there's more of a trend, I believe, um, surprisingly, to non-surgical therapy. Um, you can go, you can do, go a long way with non-surgical therapy and, and help to uh, to maintain teeth, maintain teeth for long periods of time. So. Um you know, I learned early in my career that this wasn't even all about home care either. I'll never forget one of the earliest patients I had was a hygienist. And I mean, she was a registered dental hygienist with perfect home care. And that yep. period disease kept advancing and advancing and advancing and, and yep. every two or three years. I mean, it's so, uh, 
Uh, that, that, it, it's a tough disease. I, I don't think they fully understand it, do they? No. And genetics plays a huge part. That's the level of resistance is, uh, is very, very important to determine. Um, and, you know, you can look at plaque control, and nobody's perfect with plaque control. Uh, there's a certain level that you can uh, maintain or, or attain to get. As long as you can keep that level of plaque control below the level of disease, then, you're got, then you have success. And that level of disease, so to speak, is the genetic resistance that's innate in that patient. So um, uh, that, that's a, a major component. I was so excited that uh, you were going to be on today because the last two days, every newspaper in America has ran an article that there's no studies to support flossing and that when your dentist tells you to floss, don't feel bad that you're not doing it because there's no... Did you see that article? Yes, I did. Not only did I see it, but I had three <laughs> people send it to me. <laughs> and it even came up at a dinner party I was at that night, that fr last Friday night. Um, and the dentists I talked to were saying, oh, geez, you know, what a, what a smack in the face this is. And I'm thinking, I said, you know, when you think of it, it's kind of a blessing in disguise. I mean, what else could bring flossing to the, uh, to the top of social media? Uh, you know, this opens a, a point of discussion uh, that you can have with your friends and your family and your colleagues. Um, and as far as the results of that study, true, there are not good long-term studies that support flossing. However, you can't really do a good long-term study in this day and age to support it. I mean, what would you have to have? You'd have to have a, a large sample of people. You would have to standardize their brushing. You would have to control as many factors as you can. Uh, home care, social factors, alcohol, smoking, et cetera, et cetera. And then you'd have to take half those people and have them quit flossing and um, the other half to floss. And then two, three, four, five years down the road, because periodontal disease doesn't develop quickly, you'll start to see a trend. But then those people that I would assume weren't flossing, um, you know, they got disease that's uh, irreparable. So, um, I think that flossing is a very simple technique to learn. It's easy to do. It's inexpensive. So I'm going to put the cards on my side of the table. And I guess my final uh, point would be, I'm going to, I like to floss because I like to get the stuff off from between my teeth. It drives me crazy. And I don't think people like looking at it anyway. And so um, I'm going to keep flossing until they prove it to me that it's harmful. Um, that you, you said something very, very profound and that I didn't think of, which was um, what else would have brought flossing to the top of social media. And it reminds me, um, I, I, I forgot who said it, but a long time ago, I don't care what you say about me, just get my name right. And, exactly. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I didn't think about that. It's like, I, I don't care what you say about floss. It got everybody talking about it. Yep. But yeah. uh, so I, I want to ask one more follow-up question on that. I'm sure you've been asked at a dinner party, and I just want you to. Uh, I want to talk about coconut oil pulling be, uh, because um, you know patients bring it up to these young dentists right out of school. But all over social media, there's just a ton of deal that you know if you swish your mouth with coconut oil. Uh, have you heard of that oil pulling? No. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, you, okay. Well, you, you Google coconut or oil pulling but anyway you google you gargle for 20 minutes with coconut oil and it pulls all the toxins out of your gums and and cavities and and you know what i what i just tell like when when a patient says that to me i'm like okay i can't get you to brush for two minutes and now you're going to swish for 20 minutes with coconut oil are you kidding me i mean yeah. who in the hell has got 20 minutes every morning and every night to walk around swishing coconut oil so back to my first question you were talking about that, you know, these kids, they see a uh, very perion bulb molar and, the, and they're, you know, the dilemma is, do you save it? Do you pull it? And what I, um, another thing I always think about if you, if your only tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, like if, like if you uh, send it to an oral surgeon, all they can do is extract it. I, I imagine right. that the, uh, the opinion could be economically biased or just pulling it, where if you send it to a periodontist um, who could, um, do both treatments, I mean, and that's all they do, I think that you'd be in good hands. But here, here's another really big dilemma, and it's, you, you pull that tooth, you put in an implant, 
but all the bugs were perio in the mouth, and now we're seeing periamplantitis. I mean, I, I, I've been doing implants for 30 years, and, and I don't even think periodontists have a definition yet of when periamplantitis, uh, when, when you pull the implant, when you maintain it, because so many, so many implants I see, um, as long as they're chewing ham sandwiches, it's all good. There's no yeah. pain, and I'm chewing, and you're looking at six millimeters of bloody mush around it. So talk about periimplantitis. Well, it's... Uh, and, and it also goes to your product because there's still a whole other dilemma about can you scale? I mean, you're, you're talking about sharpening a scaler. There's still a lot of people asking, a lot of hygienists asking, can you scale an implant? Because a lot of people are saying you, you messed up the surface. So talk about periimplantitis, right. Right. all that uh, stuff. Just... That, that's been a very difficult subject. Um, of course, you have the plastic curettes for, for scaling implants. I, I think the, um, uh, the treatment, uh, of course, is debridement, and the treatment for peri-implantitis is also debridement. Um, you, I don't believe you can do a lot more than um, uh, get down there with a cotton pledge, either with sterile water or with maybe chlorhexidine, and, uh, and uh, detoxify that implant surface. Uh, I know some people will will go in and um, uh, remove all the exposed threads to get a smoother surface to clean, but it it's a um, it's kind of a downhill process, and I, I think the best we can do is slow it down. Now I've been out of practice now for a while, so I'm not totally up on the literature. That's been a hot subject for the last few years, and I'm not totally up on the literature as far as anything new that's um, out there for periimplantitis. But um, local detoxification um, via chlorhexidine or sterile water or mechanically with a cotton pledge is, is the best you're going to be able to do. So were you ever a big fan of the chips that people were placing? There was a perio chip. There was, you know, these uh, minocycline chips, you know, th things that you would put localized uh, antibiotics or... Uh, there was another one made out of a, it was a solid uh, chlorhexidine gluconate. What was the name of that? The, um, mm, now you've got me thinking. Perio chip, the, um, um, I can't remember the name of that one. But were, were you ever a big fan of those? No, no. I tried them and I didn't get really good success with them. I got much better success with systemic antibiotics if I was going to go to antibiotics. Um, I think antibiotics are oftentimes um, misused and used too early in treatment. Um, uh, if we're going to take a, a localized lesion, I think we need to get in there and do thorough scaling and root planing, very thorough scaling and root planing, and work on plaque control. And if we don't get the first base with that, then we have to consider an open procedure the uh, a flat procedure and or regeneration if it's a uh, uh, intrabony pocket. Um, and then if we, uh, we're still having problems, then I think we ought to consider, uh, especially if there's multiple sites, uh, systemic antibodies on periodic use. I use metronidazole uh, a lot, and I had excellent results with that, um, and along with amoxicillin. Well, I think I think the the perio. What, what does a perio chip and a and a post buildup have in common? A, a perio chip and a post buildup. Yeah, a post and a root canal tooth. What do they have in common? Oh, they're going to fail. You mean? No. Well, they're they're With covered. Eight. They're they're covered by insurance and like oh. like. Uh, <laughs> No, 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 I, I'm serious. I mean, a lot of times, uh, I mean, this is the reality of economic incentives. Like, it, when I got out of school, I, could, I was charging $1,000 for a molar root canal and insurance to pay 80%. Now PPOs uh -huh. are, have down that to $600 to $800. But in Tokyo and Paris and London, a molar root canal is down to $100. So if there's another fee for a um, post... And the insurance pays, they have to do the post. I mean, they, they can't do the root canal at a loss. I mean, the, their staff aren't volunteers. They didn't get free rent. And it's the yeah. same thing. Yeah, I, I see these. Uh, I, I see a lot of these technologies like, well, I'm not making enough money on the cleaning, 
to break even with my hygienist, rent, mortgage, equipment, build out, computer, insurance, malpractice, professional dues, blah, blah, blah. But I get, they'll pay me an extra $10 if I place a, a localized uh, agent like a, like a Perio chip or minnow cycling or whatever. So it's, 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 it's interesting going around the world, um, looking at how, um, third party payment massively can change the treatment plan. Like, like when you're getting a hundred dollars for a root canal, you're always going to put a post in that root canal. I mean, just end of story. You're trying to get your, your fee up. Isn't that amazing? Well, it is. It's sad, but true. Uh, and that, that holds true for medicine also, uh, medical practices. You know, you, you just got to play the insurance game and it's, 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 it's a shame that that's the way it's gotten. I know. And they'll, they'll, those hospitals will pay big money for an MRI or a CAT scan. So, you know, it's like, okay, you got a bump. I can justify an MRI or a CAT scan because if yep. I don't, if I don't take X many, this hospital will lose money. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy. So, so what got you interested? What, why, what did you see in the marketplace where you decided you were going to patent a hard hand sharpening stone for scalers <laughs> and curettes? Where did that come from? Were, well, you, out, I, were, you, out, were you out fishing on the river and, and this yeah, just and I couldn't you? get my hook sharp right. Um, <laughs> I learned early in my career that if I didn't have sharp curettes and scalers, I couldn't provide the optimal care that I wanted to provide. Uh, and yeah, back when I trained, and maybe back even when you trained, you're younger than I am, uh, we got our student kit. You know, it was like the best Christmas day ever when you got your instrument kit. And in there was an Arkansas stone and a little jar of oil. And uh, that's how we sharpened our instruments. And it left a very, it would sharpen your instruments and leave a very fine edge, but it took forever. And if you only saw two, pers two patients a day, that's not a big deal. But now you get into private practice and you're seeing 20 patients a day. And uh, instrument sharpening becomes um, a big part of your day. And so I wanted to develop something that that was much more efficient than the Arkansas stone. And so I worked with some abrasives companies and we came up with a, a synthetic stone, which we can control the grit and uh, it sharpened much, much more efficiently. Um, then I took a, a, a step farther and I, I, in my career and with your lengthy private practice career, I'm sure you've had a lot of hygienists and you've worked with a lot of hygienists and auxiliaries and sharpening instruments. And although it seems like such a simple task, it's not. A lot of instruments are, are ruined by improper sharpening. And the biggest mistakes made when sharpening um, is an incorrect bevel. If you get the bevel on your instrument too steep, then you don't have clearance from the bottom of, of, the, uh, of the curette. Uh, if you get it too acute, then the blade is unsupported and then the instrument gets dull uh, quickly. Um, the other common mistake is uh, uh, creating a scaler out of a curette by bringing the, uh, the rounded end to a point. And it's, very, it's, it's technically kind of hard to bring the round that corner with a hand stone um, and to maintain that proper shape of the instrument. So I went a step farther with the development of the material of the stone and developed uh, a shape of the stone which simplified the creating of a correct bevel and simplified sharpening the uh, tip of the curette. Another thing that I strongly believe in is um, chair side sharpening because it's ludicrous to think you can start with a sharp instrument and you can go through a procedure and no matter how long or how difficult it is, that instrument does not miraculously stay sharp until the end and then it's dull. It's going to get dull as you work. and then you have a choice to make. Are you going to pick up another instrument and keep going? Or are you going to sharpen the one that you're using? And I always chose to sharpen the one I used. I have a, I had my instrument tray behind the patient. Behind me I had a counter and I had a sterile wrap with the, um, some gloss pads the, or moistened uh, sterile water and a sharpening stone. And I can sharpen that instrument in probably five seconds. Just turn around, pick up the stone give it a few uh, strokes, wipe it off, and go right back to work. And when I got done with my procedure, I didn't have a pile of dull instruments I had to sharpen. So I did that almost my entire, entire career, both with my surgery kits and my scaling kits. And I'm, I'm really amazed at how few people practice that way. Um, because 
It's the only way that you can practice and keep your instruments sharp throughout the entire procedure. But the first thing I think about your YouTube video is going back earlier to those plastic instruments. I mean, I, I don't want to piss anybody off, but I mean, I you, those plastic instruments don't do anything for them for the same no. reasons you're you're sharpening. I mean, can you really scale implants with those big bulky plastic instruments? No, you're just going to. Uh, uh, you're just going to push the plaque off if it's loose enough to push off. <laughs> yeah. No, you're not, no, you're not scaling. You're not scaling. Yeah, so, I, yeah. I, I, I think the instruments need to be sharp uh, for the same reason I don't think the plastic ones work. Um, no. Yeah. No. Yeah. You should, you should drop this uh, video in there, um, in, in the, uh, the thread, and then we'll add the video uh, at the end of the, the podcast. Okay. I. Appreciate that. Thank so, you very much. So, no, I appreciate what you did for dentistry for 40 years. So, um, is this taking off? Are you, get, are you getting people to start realizing the value of uh, cutting firewood with a sharp axe and, that, <laughs> uh, and uh, doing perio with sharp instruments? Is this, is this catching little, on? It's a, little, it's a little more difficult than uh, than you would think. But, yes, we're, we're making good progress. I, I think a lot of people um, have just not had a good education in um, uh, taking care of their instruments. Um, they, um, I, I went to the University of Michigan at that time, Dr. Ramford was chairman of the department. I, I would I could safely say that was probably the, the scaling and root planer center of the universe at that time. And so we got very good training in scaling and root planing and in, in instrument sharpening, but yet it still was rather sketchy. Um, so um, uh, there's a lot to it's a boring subject and people don't like to talk about it, but it's such an important subject. And it's amazing as to what using super sharp instruments can do for the quality of your care. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's just imperative. It is. It's it imperative. Is. So, what, um, so I, I bet you what they also want to know is how do you do a new patient uh, perio exam? I mean, not not as a periodontist where someone's referred to you and, and so you've already got a dental office and a hygienist saying this person has perio, but but the, the people you're you're talking to right now, general dentist, hygienist, what, what is yep. your what, what do you think their routine uh, perio program should be? I think they need to do uh, a probing, a full mouth probing. Uh, they need to record their pocket depth, but there's so much more information that you can gain from probing than just pocket depth. You can get a feeling of the uh, the firmness of the tissue, obviously the tendency for bleeding or suppuration. Uh, uh, you want to uh, record this data. You want to uh, uh, do a, an assessment of uh, furcation involvement. If you suspect there's furcation involvement, then you want to measure. You want to evaluate the mobility and you want to determine whether that mobility is a function of primary or secondary occlusal trauma. In other words, is the, the looseness to the tooth a function of uh, 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 an occlusal interference, a high spot, or which would be primary occlusal trauma, or your secondary occlusal trauma is a function of uh, the tooth is traumatized because it, just because it's so weak, it can't, you know, it can't, uh, it can't hold up without the given a little bit, you know, that old uh, branch in the, that, that tree in the wind, you know, it's got to bend a little bit or it's going to break. So um, these are the things that you need to, um, to determine. Um, you don't, I don't believe every patient needs this. I think you need to do a screening and spot check. And um, then if you find problems, then you want to go into a more complete uh, periodontal examination. Um, but then what do you do with that information when you have it? Um, you need a treatment plan. And I uh, was always probably a little, um, a little different than, than a lot of periodontists and how I treatment plan. I, I would put patients in three groups. I would put patients in a group that group one would be the patient that I know is going to respond to scaling and root planing. Group three would be the patient with the eight to 10 millimeter pockets, the heavy calculus, the frication involved that I know is a surgical case. And I can do all the scaling and root planing, closed case scaling and root planing I want, and I'm not gonna get there. Um, quite, uh, that, the, group, the patients I put in group two were those that I don't know. You know, they got some pretty advanced areas, but there's a, good, there's a chance they can respond to scaling and root planing. 
and see Elena Group playing alone, and then they deserve that approach. So group one, I would definitely go through a comprehensive scaling and root planning. I would do for the same for group three. Group group two, group three, I would do a gross debridement, and then I would do a surgical phase. Another controversial thing that no one ever talked about when we were in school. So when I was in school, uh, I went to college in 1980, got out in 87, and that was the, uh, the, the, the HIV. Um, it was AIDS. It started out as, you know, gay cancer, you know, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But if the one thing AIDS did that was productive out of the most horrible, horrific disease I might have seen in my lifetime um, is got the whole planet to realize that STDs occur below the belt and you and 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 it totally changed sexual behavior from Thailand to Brazil to the, the whole world got it. But now it seems like the whole world is not realizing that at the other end of the body, the mouth, um, people are communicating diseases back and forth uh, through kissing. Um, there's a lot of people that think that, um, well, well, babies are not born with P. gingivalis, Streptococcus mutans, herpes simplex one, you know, et cetera, all these things. And then they start picking them up uh, by saliva from uh, kissing people. And I was mm -hmm. wondering, and there's a lot of people that are debating it on Dental Town, and they passionately agree or disagree that it's hard. You, I could, if, if two people were married, you couldn't treat one for chlamydia every six months for 20 years if her husband was never treated. I mean, you would have to treat an STD together. You'd have to say, okay, you both are giving this back and forth together. But when right. you look at periodontal programs, I would say at least half the people on three-month recall being treated for perio the dental office has never seen her husband. So the question starts to become wondering, can I really treat you for a perio? And can you really brush and floss every morning and do Listerine and do everything just right? If you're kissing your husband, who's hasn't had his teeth cleaned in 10 years and has, and, and has a bomb mouth. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm sure it's multifactorial or we would know. I mean, it's not like, um, say gonorrhea or syphilis or chlamydia where, you know, one organism and, and, and it takes off. But, but do you think it's part of the multifactorial deal that I have to treat you and the person you're trading saliva with to manage this disease properly? I would say yes. I would say in a, you know, in a pure world, that's, you know, you got to get those organisms somewhere. Um, and the reason it's not, um, it's not so contagious, I guess, so to speak, as the we're getting back to the level of resistance, the genetics and the environment that you're in, the, the saliva environment. Um, so, but but I, I I agree. You know, we have to be passing these organisms back and forth, whether they uh, can take hold in 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 another, whether they take take hold in another in, individual and uh, become disease producing. I think uh, well, there's a lot more factors that enter into it, but certainly. Um, I think it's wise to uh, um, uh, to consider that, and there's a lot of perio offices that have they treat a patient and they, they they do a complimentary exam of the spouse, and I think that's a good service. And um, you know, from a selfish standpoint, it can generate you so uh, you know a bigger patient base too. Well, so, you know, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I just tell mom, I said, look, if, if you didn't clean your garage for ten years, a penguin wouldn't show up. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, you know, these microorganisms, I mean, you, you can't brush your teeth with uh, uh, jelly and corn syrup and all of a sudden have a bacteria called P. gingivalis out of, out of nowhere. I mean, these, these are organisms that right. have been following some living trail for a billion years. So, yeah. you know, they're, they, they got in your baby's mouth from somewhere. And um, you know, I, I used to remember when I was a little kid, I had two grandmas, obviously, and one would always give you this sweet little hug and a dry kiss on your forehead or your cheek or whatever one. And the other one would just plant this wet mouth, <laughs> lips, mouth on your dill. And when you got done, it took almost your entire arm just to wipe all the slobber off of this. And, uh, and, I, and I, I used to think, you know, gosh, you know, that, that's, just, that's just too much saliva. So, you know, I, I just I, I see it often. And I, I think it would build a practice a lot better if you just sit there and told mom, so I, I can't treat you for gonorrhea every three months if I've never seen your husband. I need to treat you both, unless you sleep in different rooms and never kiss, 
But if you're in the same bed and you're kissing, I, I need to treat the family unit. I need to treat everybody we're trading uh, saliva with. I want to ask you another another debate that's on Dental Town, and and um, I remember back in the '70s, the the periodontist would come out and would say anytime they would say not you know non surgical treatment, they were almost like a hippie. I mean, they were almost like you know it, there was a backlash and. And there were the surgeons, you know, four quads replaying keratage, four quad in surgery. And when yep. anybody popped up in the early 80s and the early 90s says, you know, we try to do non-surgical treatment. I mean, they were they were treated like they were they were crazy. So so where is the non-surgical therapies at now? Uh, are they mainstream? And, and describe describe really what a, a, a non-surgical um, therapy is versus a surgical in general. Well, I think non-surgical therapy is the backbone of periodontal therapy, um, or I should say scaling and root planing. You mentioned, you know, I put a smile on my face, curatage. You know, that's a word you don't hear anymore. I was trained with scaling and curatage, and of course, curatage has gone by the wayside. It's the root planing and the removal of the debris that's, that's important. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question and interrupt me if I'm well well not. I, I guess so, so, some people say some people say quote you non-surgical guys are just doing yeah. supervised neglect and the the, yeah. the Batman uh, and Superman go in there and flap it and osseous and all their stuff so so what would you say so let me just ask you this what would you say if someone says you non-surgical perio guys you just you just supervise neglect well, I, I, it's ludicrous because the other end of the pen, pendulum is, hey, you surgical guys are just after the insurance. Um, uh, for, I came from a school where scaling and root planing was, was very, very important, and I think it still is. Um, and, yeah, there's a point where you uh, may have to change gears. I mean, that's the name of the game, isn't it? We don't, we don't cure people. We control their disease. Um, and I think... Um, Comprehensive scaling and root planing. Remember, I talked about the three groups of patients. Comprehensive scaling and root planing is um, is the mainstay of, of periodontal therapy, and um, we do that. And if we um, we don't get the desired result, or we get the desired result for a period of time, and then um, then all of a sudden things are going south, then we have to change gears. Um, and then there's a there's a point for redoing scaling, scaling and root planing, or there's a point for going to a surgical phase. But I think they're both. Um, surgery is an extension of scaling and root planing. Uh, if you, if you if you don't consider the regeneration and the augmentation procedures, surgery is basically open flap scaling and root planing. I mean we're getting we're going to go ahead and do scaling and root planing. If we don't get the job done, then the assumption is. We're not getting all the calculus into, out of there. We're not getting adequate debridement to foster health. And so then we simply need to flap the tissue, move it away so we can see what we're doing, and we get that we get more debris out of there, more calculus. Uh, and um, then we can move into uh, other forms of treatment down the road if need be, uh, such as regeneration procedures. Well, you said it was ludicrous, and I just want to apologize to Ludicrous, the rapper. <laughs> People are always say things to Ludicrous, and I, I just think, man, <laughs> Ludicrous is, is the one who wrote Justin Bieber's song, Baby. Uh, but uh, And I also have another uh, bone to pick with you. You called it the Arkansas Stone, but you went to the University of Missouri, Kansas City, where they professionally taught you it was the Arkansas Stone. It wasn't the <laughs> Arkansas Stone. <laughs> You, well, you were you a thousand, maybe in Memphis. That when you were down yeah, in Memphis, yeah. down they in brainwashed Memphis, yeah. you as the Arkan the, the Arcan <laughs> Arkansas Stone. But it's but for my homies, it's the Arkansas Stone. <laughs> but uh, yeah. regardless of what they tell you in Memphis, so did you did you have fun in Memphis? I mean, I love that town. Well, I was only there for two years. Um, I was thrust into a situation where I had just finished my residency, and then I was. I was put into a position to start a, a residency program of my own, so that was kind of consuming. Uh, I didn't get downtown Memphis too much. We lived out in Germantown area, and um, um, but it was it was a nice uh, a nice spot. I actually like Kansas City a lot more. I thought Kansas City was a fabulous town. 
You know, yeah. um, you know the the deal with uh, I live in Phoenix. I, I so I went to Nelson School in Kansas City, and the thing with Phoenix is that before they invented the air conditioner, there there wasn't even fifty thousand people here. So uh, yeah. it was World War II and the advent of the swamp cooler, the first commercial available in air conditioned desert. So in Phoenix, there's just I mean, I mean, basically something 50 years old is the oldest thing in town. And so the, the, the uh, culture of Memphis and Kansas City is amazing. And I love the weather in Phoenix. I, I love that. Uh, but man, and I love the desert. But man, the, the culture in Kansas City and Memphis, I would uh, I wish Kansas City was out here in the desert. That's what I really wish. Yeah, it was a, I, I very much enjoyed it. It's a great town, but where I'm living now is pretty hard to beat. I got Lake Michigan out my back door. And uh, although it's 90 degrees here today, which is pretty unusual for us, uh, it's, uh, it's a great place to be in the summertime. You should come see me. I would love to come see it. Now, I'm, when I'm on the, uh, the uh, so we have 50 categories on Dental Town, and one of them is periodontist. So whenever I'm, um, Whenever I'm with a uh, specialist, I'm always trying to ask him, you know, what, you know, market data driven questions, what everybody's talking about. Another hugely controversial thing is the use of lasers in dentistry. It seems like everybody has an opinion on do lasers work. And, and one of the reasons they're concerned is, Rick, they're coming out of school $350,000 in student loans. And like a Lenap laser, that, that, that's over $100,000. Uh, but mm -hmm. they want to be a good dentist. They're, they're going long. They're 25. They're going to do this till they're 65. Um, is investing six figures for a Lenap, is that going to make them a better, treat perio better? What would no, you say on that investment? I never, I never did it, if that answers your question. I never found the benefit to it to justify that kind of, a, kind of an investment. I just uh, wasn't interested in, in owning a laser. I didn't think I needed it. To provide the kind of care that I wanted to provide. Another question they're always asking is, well, we'll talk about what you talked talk about at the beginning, um, regeneration. Um, wh wh where is regeneration um, at um, from when you got out of school and were doing residencies? What, what did it turn into? Well, there, there wasn't regeneration when I got out of dental school. Um, we, would, uh, we would debride the pockets and we had intrabony pockets. We would, uh, you know, occasionally just with flap surgery, we would see some regeneration. Um, but regeneration didn't uh, move to the forefront until probably, what, 25 years ago, I would, somewhere, somewhere in that range. Um, and um, uh, demineralized freeze-dried bone uh, it, it seems to be still the, um, um, the gold standard with your collagen membranes. Um, uh, regeneration um, is a very interesting subject. It's uh, it's challenging. Um, I think it's uh, it's something you, you need to be uh, selective in the cases that you that you choose for regeneration. Um, when you know when you think of the fact that you may have a, a six millimeter pocket and an intrabony defect and you can scale and uh, or even open flap. Uh, curatage uh, or curate root plane that pocket you could maybe get a millimeter of regeneration uh, you could put some bone in a membrane over that and maybe get an additional millimeter or two of bone but um, an extra millimeter of t or two of bone on one surface of one tooth uh, how significant is that to the entire um, dentition um, now sometimes when you regenerate you, you're going to be able to aid in pocket reduction, which could aid in the long-term prognosis for that particular tooth. Uh, so I, I certainly think there's an indication for that, but I, I think it, regeneration sometimes is, is um, maybe done when it's not necessary. Here, here's another dilemma that young kids have. They come out of school where they're professionally taught, you know, these are the contraindications uh, to place an implant, you know, smoker, diabetes, high blood pressure, you know, you know all, all the bad stuff, bad home care. And then we get out of school, and that's the reason the patient needs an implant. I mean, you, you know, the people that come into your office that, that eat implants, they're not marathon runners that brush and floss every morning and eat broccoli and, and think kale is for dessert. <laughs> so, I mean, when you're out there in Phoenix, all the people that need all these extractions and implants and all this stuff like that, I mean, you know, they, 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 <laughs> I mean, they drink too much. They smoke too much. They do everything wrong. 
So it's kind of like if, if you listen to the, the academians, you get rid of 80% of my practice. I mean, 80% okay. of my practice does not qualify for any of these advanced treatments. So, so how do you manage the academic? Well, you wouldn't want to do it in a smoker, drinker, fat guy that never exercises high blood pressure. And then they're like, okay, that, you, just, you just eliminated my practice. Should I just close? <laughs> should I close down and start selling cars? So, so, how, so, what, what, what do you? How, what is your brain thinking when uh, Sam comes in there? He's from Michigan. He's a drinker. He's a smoker. He's overweight. He don't exercise. He, you know. Well, you can you, you talk to these people. You do the best you can. Certainly, we want we'd love to see him all quit smoking, um, but you know that's just not the real world. Uh, <laughs> it's not the entire know. real. It's not the entire Arizona. <laughs> no, no, it's, well, it's not the entire Michigan either. Um, I treated a, tons of smokers, and I treated tons of so smokers successfully. Maybe it would have been more successful if they never smoked, but, you know, who's to judge that? Um, I think that we as dentists, uh, we can talk to patients about their smoking, and they can um, make their own decisions, but I think we... I think we owe it to them to treat them because I think we can help them, and uh, help sometimes is in a matter is is not black and white. It's it's their shades of gray. So I I never uh, hesitated to treat smokers and drinkers or people that you know that maybe had a few too many cocktails every day. Um, you can talk to them about it, um, tell them what you think, but um, you know you can't you can't. Uh, you can't motivate everybody to a perfect life. Well, when I tell these kids if they're in school, if they want to practice in a world where no one's smoking and drinking, they need to move to Utah, or uh, <laughs> they either they either need to move to Salt Lake City or or enter the real world because uh, that's the reason most people are in my chair for treatment is because they obviously weren't uh, doing everything right. Another thing, um, there's a huge debate on in Dental Town. Um, there's a it seems like in every specialty. Um, dentistry especially they're coming to this uh, oral health systemic connection I mean uh, they were ear doctor for their whole life now they're realizing the ear is related to other parts of the body um, dentists cardiologists everybody's kind of walking it seemed it seemed like a hundred years ago it was one doctor did the whole body and then at the yeah. end of the century there were 58 specialties for MDs and nine for dentists but now it looks like the pendulum swinging back and on this oral health can uh, systemic link um, you know, I mean, there's just lots of research where people are th finding um, bugs in the mouth associated with uh, heart disease, Alzheimer's. I mean, there's, there's, I, I think, nine different organs that they're finding streptococcus mutans in, plaque. They're finding it in Alzheimer's. Like, what, what do you think of this uh, oral systemic leak? Do you think a lot of this is just correlation, uh, correlation or do you think some of it's causal? What, what's your view on oral systemic link. Well, I, I think it's also. I think you know, it's. I think it's rather narrow-minded to think you could take one part of the body and and segment it and isolate it from the rest. I mean, we're, the body is uh, an in, integrated organism, and things that happen in the mouth are going to have affects other parts of the body and vice versa. I mean, what affects? I, we certainly don't know all the answers, but I, I think there's a. Uh, uh, I think it's it's good for. For healthcare to realize that um, there is a, a interrelation between um, the oral cavity and the rest of the body. I mean, back when we were dental students, I mean, how far you know physicians were on one side of the street and dentists were the other, and they never, you know, they didn't communicate, they didn't interact. Um, but there's a, certainly a, there's relationships. Uh, the preterm babies, uh, the you know, the heart disease, the um, um, uh, other medical um, uh, situations. I had a, a lady once that uh, uh, was in for a routine prophy and um, a maintenance patient, absolutely no health issues, no contraindications. She had a prophy, uh, a follow-up care, went home, uh, started to develop some weird symptoms, had seizures, and ended up with a brain abscess, and they found that the uh, organism that caused a brain abscess was uh, from the oral cavity. Now, whether that had anything to do with the prophy or not, who knows? But, um, I mean, these things happen. I think you just hit the nail on the head. You know, remember when uh, Watergate happened? You know, they just kept saying, follow the money, follow the money. 
follow yeah. the slush fund. They, they thought if you follow the, oh, or an Iran Contra hearing with, uh, what was it, Oliver North? You know, yeah. the, the, every lawyer always says, you know, follow the money. And if you give me the motive, I can probably solve the crime and I'll solve it by following the money. And the insurance companies, I just listened to this lecture in um, uh, Fort Lauderdale last month. And it was by the dental director of uh, Concordia. And the pri- the treatment cost of a preemie is huge. I mean, it's, it's millions of dollars. And oh, they're yeah. looking at data now where if that pregnant mother um, didn't have gingivitis and periodontal disease, you know, if you would have spent a thousand bucks treating that, you might have saved a million a million bucks. And even if it was, uh, even if you just delayed the premature baby like a month, I mean, every week you can keep it in the womb is tens of thousands of dollars. And I, I think um, uh-huh. I, I think the oral systemic length is going to get um, bigger and bigger and bigger as they follow the money and realize, okay, we, we'd rather pay for her to go to the hygienist than to go to the neonatal center for three months. Well, that certainly makes sense. Yeah, and I, sense. I think uh, I think uh, um, I, I think premies is is the biggest cost, the biggest prevention, and I think that's where it's going to land first. So, uh, my gosh, uh, uh, you've been amazing. I only got you for uh, two more minutes. Uh, is there any uh, uh, okay? Another thing I want I want to ask you. This is something I've always noticed amongst my friends. Okay, when yeah. I talk to a periodontist, they'll tell you, okay, they'll they'll be in a small town. Let, let's say they're in a small town and there's uh, 20 dentists in the town and they're the only periodontist. They'll tell yep. you that 80% of their crown lengthening comes from, you know, three guys and the other 17 dentists almost never, ever send them one. So if, if you, did you see that 80-20 rule where 20% of your referrals sent you 80% of your crown lengthenings and the 80 of the 80%? So, so what, 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 why is that? Why is that? Well, do you confirm that? Do you agree with that phenomenon or not? Well, yes. I mean, that's uh, that's true from your periodontal patients. There was a lot of offices that didn't have any periodontal disease in them, and that's because they weren't looking for it. Uh, it's the but, uh, but philosophy- these dentists will sit around the table and say, "Okay, you've never sent the periodontist a crown lengthening. Well, do you do crown yeah. lengthening?" And the dentist says, "No." So, so I, I've been at many, many a dinners where my friends are looking at you know, they're they're uh, you know they're jabbing each other, saying. Dude, how can you not do crown lengthening? So, so there's right. this phenomena where I think 20% of the dentists um, do it, refer, do it themselves, refer to a parent and yes. 80% never do it. So, talk about crown lengthening. Why, why, why do we see that phenomena? Well, it, it's an appreciation of the biologic width. Uh, you can put a crown uh, with inadequate biologic width. And the crown will last for probably some time. You may have chronic gingivitis around that, and eventually, um, you may develop periodontal breakdown because of it. Um, if you are tuned into a, a, an adequate biologic width, then you realize the attachment apparatus in situations needs to be moved down, so you have room for your margin, and you have room for an epithelial cuff uh, to maintain a, a, an ideal healthy situation. I mean, how many? How many crowns do you see uh, on new patients that have inflammation around the margins? Uh, I, I would suspect a, a fair number. Uh, a lot of crowns are made with a, uh, without consideration for a proper biologic width. And the other, the other thing about that is the ferrule. I mean, you know, a lot of these people see not much tooth structure, so they think they're going to cram this long post down into the root. And about the only thing a post can do is fracture the root. Um, yeah. But if you did crown lengthening and you told the periodontist, I want a three millimeter ferrule all the way around that tooth, then mm-hmm. then you've got a solid restoration. Mm-hmm. But if you have, you know, yes. if, if you have a back half of the tooth with basically no ferrule or only a millimeter and then you're and then you're sub G and then you think you're going to fix that with a post. I mean, it's just uh, it's just yeah. it's just too many things are going wrong. Yes, you definitely need that biologic width. And uh, and that'll buy you feral. So uh, so any uh, uh, any any uh, last uh, things you want to talk about? Well, um, no, I think we've covered subjects quite well. I, I do want to mention uh, I, I get so many questions about referrals, and uh, you know how do I refer this patient? He's gone to my buddy down the road for twenty years. Now he's coming to me, and he's got six eight millimeter pockets. And uh, what do I tell this patient without 
while maligning my colleague. Um, I think the thing we can, first of all, we have to be honest with our patients. Um, and I think we can be honest and still um, uh, smooth things over a little. Maybe that's not the best term. But my point is periodontal disease is oftentimes cyclical. And people can go along with minimal pocket depth, maybe some calculus and not the greatest plaque control. And they're, you know, they're fine. And then all of a sudden, they'll, they'll get a, an exacerbation. They'll get an increased pocket depth. They'll get increased inflammation. They'll get bone loss. And bingo, all of a sudden, they're a perio patient. Uh, and I think the point to make is if it's your patient or it's a patient referred, you know, there's a new patient to you, even if it's your own patient, you, know, you can always uh, rely on, on, on the true fact that periodontal disease is oftentimes cyclical. And, you know, you may have been fine for a number of years and all of a sudden something's happened. Uh, one patient I had had uh, multiple heart attacks in a year's period of time and all of a sudden their periodontal health went right down the um, south and whether there is a direct relationship there I can't say but there may very well have been um, so don't don't hesitate to refer that patient uh, or uh, certainly you have to you have to inform that patient of their present condition um, uh, but you can explain to them that um, it may have not been the that may have not been the have not been the case six months ago or a year ago Great point, and I want you to address another case. There's a lot of dentists who, you know, when a new patient comes in, they jump, they jump right into name, address, what medications, have you ever had herpes, gonorrhea, you know, all this health stuff. But a lot of really smart dentists who know that we're in the people business do a lot of psychographic information, like why did you leave your last dentist? What have you ever liked the most about any dentist you've gone to? Did you ever have a dentist you loved? Did you ever have a dentist you didn't love? And find out what, what makes them tick. And when you ask these people why they left their last dentist, one of the top three responses for 30 years is, well, I just went in there for a cleaning, and uh, I think he's just trying to make money off me or bill my insurance, and he wanted to do these this deep cleaning thing, and I told him I just wanted to get my teeth clean, and, uh, you know, I don't, you know, and it's literally probably one of the biggest flags that that the dental office is scared because when i tell you uh rick you're not we, we can't do a cleaning we need to do four quads of root plane curatage it's a high percent chance that you're just going to never come back well i think the key there is relationship you have to develop that relationship with your patient um dentistry and periodontics are are, are ideal specialties for that because we see patients on a recurrent basis over long periods of time. But you know, you're treating more than the teeth, you're treating the patient. And, and you need to develop that relationship. Um, and if you do, those patients are going to, they, they believe you. And, uh, and, and they, will, they, they will go along with your recommendations. Uh, if you get a new patient in your office that's you know, been very content to go in every six months and get his teeth clean and all of a sudden you know, you're the new guy on the block and you want to do four quadrants or root plane and this and this. And, you know, he's going to say, wait a minute, you know, why have I been able to do nothing but get my teeth cleaned for the last 10 years? And now I have to have all this extra work done. you got to develop that relationship first, even if it involves postponing some treatment, uh, postponing some needed treatment, not emergency treatment, certainly, but uh, postponing needed treatment for maybe an appointment or two until you can so you can start to cement that relationship. And I also want to tell young kids that a lot of a lot of these young kids are traveling across the country to go learn some seminar about setting up a soft tissue management system or you know a, a perio program and they want to get all the forms, they want to do it right. And every time these young dentists do something right, they always get out their checkbook and write a huge check. And, and I'll tell you, the best kept secret in dentistry is if you want to set up a periodontal program, just get on your phone and start calling periodontists. A lot of those periodontists, um, one of their hygienists, uh, that, that might be like her, her big, she loves that. And you know, you can block off an afternoon and th their hygienist will come in or whatever, but I don't think you have to spend a dollar to set up a perio program. Uh, most periodontists will help you do that. Do you agree with that or disagree? Sure. Oh, very much. In fact, I had a colleague of mine and I, and we, we gave, um, uh, hands-on courses for hygienists and general practices uh, and scaling and root planing and you know, other people would say to us why in the world are you doing that you know you should be doing that scaling and root planing well it goes back to the uh, 
the story of the flossing. It's you know, don't tell me tell me something good or bad, but you know, get my name right. Uh, you know, get your name out there and uh, uh, get the get get the name of periodontics out there, periodontal disease. Help these hygienists recognize it because they're going to do the scaling and root planing in these other offices, and then they're going to refer the surgical phase on to you if there's a surgical phase. So. Um, um, I, I, I'm, I, I, we, we've gone over an hour, we're five minutes over, but I, I, I keep having overtime questions. I got I'll, I'll, I, I, this is the last one. I'll let you go. Go ahead. Um, for 40 years, there's a, I, I think periodontists employ more hygienists per person than, than the general dentist by far, probably on average double. And you guys usually have very good relations with your hygienist. I think they're better. I think the periodontist hygienist working relationship is better than the general dentist hygienist relationship. Uh, a lot of hygienists have told me that, that they, um, that they enjoyed that um, job the most. But politically, um, hygienists have uh, always talked about wanting to have independent practice. It's been so controversial. Now, now there's another one with expanded function duty, dental assistants or dental therapists or whatever. But... You and I have been out three decades plus, and when a state's passed independent licensure where a hygienist can open up her own practice unsupervised, like in the state of Colorado, I mean, there's only like five people doing it in the entire state. Why do you, why do you think when hygienists uh, propose in a state to go that they want you know the right to be independent when it economically doesn't make sense? I mean, hygienists, it only really works if they're being subsidized by crown and bridge and implants and surgeries and all these other things. But why do you think that's so darn controversial? Uh, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I know that medicine, if we look at our medical colleagues, they have the, they have the PAs, the physician assistants, and they are, um, very highly trained people, uh, providing healthcare under, direct supervision of the, of the uh, physician. And I think that works extremely well. Um, and I think the same thing can work in dentistry. Within, I think there can be expanded duties. I, I don't have a big problem with that. Having uh, uh, private, you know, their own hygienists having their own private practices. I, um, I don't know if the, the, the training and background is there for them to, uh, to take on that responsibility. Well, okay, but whether someone agrees with you or not, disagrees, that, that's not the issue. The, the issue is that there's 211,000 Americans alive with a dental degree, and, and it'll be all this noise and noise and emotion and all that, and it'll come down to be like five hygienists. It's like, it's like wouldn't you have spent better time just watching the Olympics instead of getting yourself all worked up over the five hygienists in a country of 3.6 million square miles with a third of a billion people. I mean, it seems, it seems like it's, you know, it's the same thing with these dental therapists. I mean, they're talking about like one person on a snowmobile in Alaska, yet it just emotionally consumes them and works them up in a frenzy. And I'm like, dude, don't you have anything better to worry about? Well, I, I, I certainly see your point. <laughs> uh. <laughs> maybe, maybe, uh, maybe I'm uh, too laid back on that. Or, or maybe I, you get old, you realize, so much of all the emotional rant is just noise, and it never amounts to anything. I'll never forget that. Uh, anyway, yeah. Thanks for your innovation. They say that necessity is the mother of all inventions. That's right. And That's right. Uh, But uh, thanks for uh, uh, all that you do for dentistry, and thank you so much for being on my show. Well, thank you for having me. Good all right. Care. All right, buddy. Have a rocking hot day. Thanks. You too. Bye-bye.